series, I've traveled across the continent and down the centuries, from the Renaissance to the French Revolution, to understand just why so little of the art on display is by women. Time and time again, ambitious female artists found their path blocked, tied to the home, starved of training. Only a handful of tenacious and resourceful women broke through to scorch a trail for posterity. But finally, in the middle of the 19th century, here in Britain, it looked as if all that was set to change. In 1842, the government opened its very first female school of design, right next to the men's, here in Somerset House. What a breakthrough after centuries of disapproval. Women finally painting and learning alongside their male contemporaries. Well, not quite. Just six years after it opened, the female school was moved to the other side of the Strand. An area then infamous for pornographic bookshops and unsavoury pubs. As a journalist in 1851, Riley noted, If a paternal government had studied to select the worst possible place for such a school, they could not have more completely succeeded. The message was crystal clear. Female artistry did not warrant the prestige of male. Women were segregated. Officially, second class. But whatever the art establishment believed, society was changing fast. With women pressing on the door of the universities, the professions and parliament. In a galaxy of exploding potential, women were flowering in even more adventurous ways. As photographers, as sculptors, as architects. I have chosen just six. Six women who in unique ways have transformed our vision of the world. Among them a housewife in rural Sweden who would reinvent our interiors and lead the vanguard of a lifestyle revolution. An artist whose failing eyesight would refocus the way we see our outdoor spaces. And a pioneering modernist who escaped to the austere deserts of New Mexico in search of a new language of painting, creating an entirely original artistic landscape. In the hundred years after 1850, women would take art into unexpected territories. It was not enough to reflect the world. Female artists were bent on changing it. Over the centuries, there was one genre of painting that had remained the ultimate masculine stronghold war art, and rarely with more pomposity than in the age of empire. But what would happen when a female artist decided to join the fray? The battlefield reeked of testosterone. Any artist who wanted to capture its visceral glory needed an iron stomach and an imperviousness that angelic Victorian women were seen to lack. And yet, it was the pupil of the fledgling female school of design who would become the most celebrated war artist of her time. Lady Butler was born simply Elizabeth Thompson in 1846 to a wealthy family. So pretty and delicate, there was no outward clue that she would grow up to be anything more than a textbook Victorian angel in the house. Unless you looked inside her sketchbooks, that is. This one, done when she was only 14. This is just the sort of thing you might imagine. 
a teenage girl of the mid-Victorian period to be producing. This is two women in a drawing room. It has a touch of little women about it. But as you go on, what this reveals to my utter amazement is even as a young teenager, she was preoccupied with history, with battles, and with men. Well, a bayonet charge, firing a pistol. Where on earth did this come from? Lady Butler couldn't account for it herself. She even reflected in her diary, how strange that I should be impregnated, if that's the right word, with the warrior spirit, given that there were no soldiers in either my mother or my father's family. What I see, even in these tiny sketches, is the unusual ambition of a young woman, even in something miniature she's reaching after the male and the epic. Determined to further her ambitions, Butler, age 19, enrolled herself in the new female school of design, writing in her diary on the eve of her first day. Ah, oh, they shall hear of me someday. That day dawned sooner than she could have imagined when in 1874, Butler submitted one of her works to the Royal Academy. It was here, in this most male-dominated of arenas, that her art would provoke the most startling reaction. When the exhibition was open to the public, she caused a sensation. The painting was mobbed. The police had to be called. She reflected it in her diary that night. I awoke this morning and found myself famous. So famous, in fact, that just a few weeks later, the painting was bought by Queen Victoria herself. And today it hangs in pride of place, here in St. James's Palace. It's known as the Roll Call, or to give it its more precise title, calling the roll after an engagement in the Crimea. This is not a celebration of noble heroism. Instead, it's a depiction of the costs of war for the ordinary soldiers. The carnage of the Crimean War some 20 years before was still raw in popular memory. Undeterred, Butler had chosen to expose the painful truth ground in mud and gore. They are an absolute study in weariness and exhaustion is suffused with human emotion. The painting went on tour across the great northern cities and was mobbed wherever it went. Arguably, this is the painting that touched the Victorians like no other. It's an irony that a woman who was so effective in depicting the realities of war never actually saw a battlefield for herself. But Butler explained in her autobiography that a painter should be careful to keep a distance, to stop the vile details blinding them to the noble things that rise beyond. However, this distance has done nothing to diminish the impact of her work upon those who have experienced conflict First hand. Butler wrote in her diary, I thank God that I only paint for the pathos and not the glory of war. Mm. If I had seen even the corner of one battlefield, I would never paint another war painting. Mm. But I think that makes her even more extraordinary. Mm. You've got to bear in mind that Butler was probably the first artist to actually bring the human soldiering individual face mm. of conflict onto the canvas. Butler didn't go to the Crimea. But you've been to Helmand and Afghanistan. Well, I have drawn enormous inspiration from her work because I think she, as a woman, was really trying to do exactly what I'm trying to do, which is, which is make the public aware of the reality of soldiering and the individual and the human being. Butler's sensitive depictions of the humble soldier saw her dubbed the Florence Nightingale of the brush. But characteristically, 
She didn't want to be cast as merely a sensitive female artist. If her male contemporaries captured the drama and violence of warfare, then so would she. A royal commission to paint the army's last stand against the Zulu at Rourke's Drift would test her ability to capture action to its limit. As a woman with no experience of war, could she rise to the challenge? It's something to do with her natural ability as an artist. You feel this battle, you feel the moment. So how did a female artist achieve something like this? Because we know she never went to the front. The way she did that was actually to go to Portsmouth, where the army was stationed, and see people who were here at this event, and they reenacted it for her. So realistically, they put on their uniforms and they acted it out. So she was making sure every button, every colour was exactly right, as well as the expressions on the faces. I think that's the exciting thing about Lady Butler. It's a bit for me like today, a female director making an action movie, saying, I'm not going to do a romantic comedy, I'm not going to play on those stereotypes, and she gets to the heart of the matter and she gives us this action piece. This is what we think of as a history painting really. I really like that you use that very history, history painting. That's the thing. That's what great artists were supposed to be creating, history paintings. Female artists, well, they could do flower paintings, they could do portraits or landscapes, but to do this real bare knuckle history painting stuff, it wasn't thought to be the stuff of ladies. And yet Lady Butler is able to do it. <laughs> Determined that her work would be as authentic as possible, she restaged cavalry charges, bravely standing before thundering hooves. She wrote, I twice saw a charge of the Greys before painting Scotland forever, and I stood in front to see them coming on. Lady Butler's art began to overturn centuries of prejudice. She even forced the critic John Ruskin, who believed that no woman could paint, to eat his words and marvel, this is Amazon's work. Butler had triumphed on her own terms in the genre most esteemed by the art establishment. But it was the art establishment itself that was to come under threat now. Just across the channel, rebellious young painters were throwing out the rule book. Detractors sneered at them as mere impressionists, but they were revolutionaries, demanding that art be fast, instinctive, spontaneous, requiring no formal training. Surely, here at last was a manifesto for women. Of course, it could never be that simple. Here at Christie's in London, there's a major auction of the finest Impressionist paintings about to take place. Flicking through the sale catalogue, the big guys of Impressionism are here. Renoir, Monet, Degas. But on sale are also two paintings by a woman, Bert Morisot. For this nude here, lot 315, Please start me at 180,000, please. 180, 190, thank you. 190, 200,000 at 220, but in Texas, welcome Texas, online. And 240 back in London. Right at the back of the room at 280. Any advance? Selling to the gentleman standing in the distance, all done, 280,000. Business is brisk today, but at the first Impressionist auction over a century ago, interest in Morisot, the only woman in the show, was feverish. Back in 1875, she was the one who bore the brunt of the attention. 
At a sale that the Impressionists organized in Paris, it was Morisot's work which gained the highest bids. She was a phenomenon. Her talent, coupled with a smoldering beauty, brought her much attention. Not least from the father of Impressionism himself, Edouard Manet. He would go on to paint Morisot 11 times. There she is, all in black, rather sleepily extending a pink slippered foot. Not very proper at all. And that lack of propriety was noticed by critics in one painting in particular, Le Repos, in which Manet has the beautiful dark-haired Morisot reclining on a plush pink sofa, presenting herself almost as if she's going to sink onto that sofa, full of dreamy sensuality. I think all these portraits hint that underneath the beautiful clothes there's a woman chafing against the conventional restraints of femininity. Which is surprising, as Morisot was groomed to follow convention, not defy it. Born in 1841 to wealth and privilege, she grew up in the exclusive Parisian suburb of Passy. This was a world where women might be tutored in art to make them marriage material, but not to make them professional artists. So the exceptional talent portrayed by Morisot and her sister Edmar began to raise serious concerns. One of their tutors, Joseph Guichard, recognized the girl's unusual potential. So he warned their mother, with characters like your daughters, my teaching will make them painters, not minor amateur talents. And do you really understand what that means? In the grand society of the haute bourgeoisie in which you move, it would be a revolution. I would say even a catastrophe. Yet the Morisot sisters were not to be put off, following the established path for any male artist, becoming copyists in the Louvre. However, Edmar's career was short-lived. She succumbed to family obligation. Marrying a naval officer in 1869, she felt obliged to retire her paints. And her wistful regret ever after for the life of the studio made Morisot all the more determined not to give it up. Morisot's friendship with Edouard Manet drew her into the circle of his younger acolytes. Men who were striving to capture modern life on canvas. She was inspired. The Impressionists, as they became known, were breaking with the conventions of the art establishment. But they still had charmingly old-fashioned ideas about the roles of women and men. They claimed the freedom of the streets, moving freely about the city, luxuriating in anonymity, idling and observing high life and low. This was the life of the flaneur, or urban wanderer. But a female wanderer, a flaneur's impossible. The cafes of Bohemian Montmartre have long since disappeared, but there's one bar remaining, La Bonne Franquette, which boasts of its link to Impressionism. Here, it's announcing the great artists who used to gather here to drink. Pizarro, Sisley, Degas, Cezanne. Bert Morisot's name is not there. She knew them all. But of course, the streets at night, the bars and cafes of Bohemian Paris were no place for a lady. 
but Morisot was too determined to be defeated. She took the principles of Impressionism and applied them in her own context. Unconventional art in the most conventional setting. And this is the modern life that Morisot painted. She couldn't go to the bars, the cafes and the theatres to capture Paris of the 1870s, but she painted the world that she knew. Drawing rooms, nurseries, bedrooms and gardens. In 1874, aged 33, Morisot married Edouard Manet's brother, Eugène. She longed to be a mother and had one precious daughter, Julie, four years later. Morisot was one of the very few women who managed to blend domesticity and an artistic career. That blend was captured on her canvases, creating a fresh version of modern family life. What she's saying here is that modern life and its fleeting moments are just as vivid in the private world of women and children as they are on the streets. And so she's immortalised for all time these wonderful transient, fugitive moments of what it is to be alive. But this shimmering originality did not establish Morisot's reputation alongside her fellow male impressionists. Her wealth and privilege meant she was never driven by the same need to sell her works so upon her premature death of pneumonia in 1895, aged just 54, she had failed to secure a lasting legacy. As her grave bears stark testament. I'm depressed to discover that even in death, she's quite literally overshadowed by the celebrity of her more famous brother-in-law. Edouard Manet, up there, down here, her husband, and then Bert Morisot, Verve de Eugene Manet. So, widow, that is her only attribution. As her fellow impressionist, Camille Pizarro, lamented on hearing news of her death, poor Madame Morisot, the public hardly knows of her. And yet, some 120 years later, the art buying community certainly knows her name today. Morisot's delicate female nude fetched an impressive £280,000. But there's no escaping the fact her fellow male impressionists raise far greater sums. Well, I think there is a, a sense in the art market that the blue chip artist that one immediately thinks of, of Monet and Renoir, but also Picasso and Chagall and, and Matisse and so forth. Has there ever been a blue chip female? Uh, there are starting to be. I mean, most of the, the big prices for female artists have been made in the last five to ten years. Um, so for Morisot, uh, the world record auction price was made in February of this year. Christy sold a wonderful early masterpiece by her for nearly £7 million. And that's a world record for any female artist. To put that in context, mm. Renoir's can go for... 20 million mm. and Monet's for 40 million. Are you and the buyers saying she's not as good? I don't think so. I think she is very groundbreaking. You know, we still see a painting like this and, and think 
uh, that it's that it's quite revolutionary, um, you know, particularly in figure painting uh, as opposed to landscape painting. Um, but I think you know she was uh, certainly, in my view, she was la pressionniste par excellence, um, and and I think her reputation um, certainly should be uh, larger today. For all its picture postcard prettiness, Impressionism cast off the dead hand of tradition and grasped anew the immediacy of existence. But there is more to art than two dimensions. Open your eyes wider and broaden your definition and new worlds of creativity are revealed far beyond the walls of galleries. Here, nestled in bucolic Surrey, a female artist would take inspiration from the Impressionists and take her art to an entirely new territory. She would work on a far bigger canvas. Gertrude Jekyll is one of the most celebrated garden designers in history. But to see her as a mere horticulturalist is to miss the flavour of her genius. She was first and last an artist. She saw the garden as a canvas on which the gardener paints or embroiders his picture, more or less formed in his mind, using for his pigments the plants that best suit his purpose. Gertrude Jekyll was born in 1843, just two years after Bert Morisot. In a career that spanned 60 years, she would design over 400 gardens, publish 14 books and write over a thousand articles. She was determined to make the public see the potential lying just outside the window. But long before she picked up the spade, she held a paintbrush. Jekyll was, in fact, a student of the Female School of Design, just like her contemporary, Lady Butler. She was intent on becoming a professional artist, but her career was to be threatened before it had even begun. Like all professional artists, Gertrude Jekyll partly trained by copying the paintings of others. And here's her version of Turner's Ancient Rome. I think you can see her personal fascination with Turner's sublime use of subtle colour contrasts and light. But she faced a terrible handicap. Short sight of the severest kind, inadequate and painful. She admitted, my natural focus is just two inches. What a handicap in a woman who had the ambition to paint on this scale. Jekyll was forced to find a different way to channel her creativity. Embroidery, embossing, photography, glass making, collage. These crafts were dignified as never before by the arts and crafts movement of the later 19th century. Arts and crafts rejected mass-produced industrial design as soulless and proposed the recovery of handicraft skills and the protection of rural traditions. So Jekyll's blend of art and rural craft led the zeitgeist and she saw that one arena was ripe for reinvention. The garden. She broke absolutely with the formal conventions of the Victorian flower bed, the kind of thing you can still see today in corporation parks or at the seaside. Here she seems to have dabbled the white on with a painterly eye in these flowing free drifts of white and pastel pink. I can really see now why she claimed to be inspired by the Impressionists. Jekyll approached a garden like a painting. As she wrote, plants were like having a box of paints from the best colourman, and she used them to sparkling effect. He 
It's only when you see one of her gardens in all its glory that you appreciate what she was trying to do. While many of Jekyll's gardens have long since vanished, one in particular, here at Upton Gray in Surrey, has been restored by following her instructions to the letter. She argued that creating a beautiful garden was harder than creating a beautiful painting. Her gardens were designed to be seen from many different vistas. They changed over the course of the day. This white would really scintillate and sparkle in the evening. They changed over the seasons and she battled and responded to the elements. This is art wrested from living nature, art in 3D. Jekyll defied convention and liberated an entire nation of amateur gardeners to experiment with plants and color harmonies in their own backyard. A legacy that is still with us today. No other garden designer has had such a lasting impact on our landscape. Her obituary in the Times acclaimed her as a pioneering gardener, but also as true artist with an exquisite sense of colour. Just as it inspired Gertrude Jekyll to reveal the artistic potential of the English country garden, the arts and crafts movement was to light the touch paper for a revolution inside our homes. Four hours north of Stockholm, deep in the Swedish pine forest, an artist was to turn interior decoration and lifestyle into a family-friendly art form. <laughs> Karen Larson was not a revolutionary in a conventional sense at all. She embraced the traditional roles of wife, mother and homemaker. Yet it was in the very role of homemaker and in the lifestyle that she crafted in this house that she did so much to influence the way we see our own. Karen was blessed with affluent parents who supported her education. She studied as a painter at the Swedish Academy of Art. Karen might have become a professional artist herself had she not met and fallen in love with another Swedish painter, the impoverished, insecure but ambitious Carl Larsson. They married in 1883 and Karen stopped her own painting and started a family. Looking at this self-portrait of Carl, he's clearly the artist of the family. You'd be forgiven for not seeing Karen at all. And yet, if you look a little closer, you can see that she is in fact busily sewing. Her creativity had not ceased. Karen was crafting a family home and Carl's paintings offer an intimate window into that private world. The Larsons moved to this house in 1901, and Karen set about transforming it from a dark old farm into a warm family home. cheerful, vibrant family dining room. This is not a palace. Clearly, Karen Larson's interior decoration is on a domestic scale and everything is decorated with her own hand. Karen 
was rejecting outright the pervasive weight and gloom of 19th century interior decoration. With a joyful combination of bright colours, mismatched furniture, abstract patterns, and loose bunches of flowers. We are so familiar with this informal look, it's easy to forget that it was once shockingly new. This was cutting edge as design and as a way of life. The house here at Sombol is certainly remote, but as this study reveals, she was anything but cut off. I see it especially in the periodicals that Karen kept up with. Art and decoration from France, the studio, an arts and crafts magazine from England, and culture and decoration, a German periodical. Karen Larson was engaged with international aesthetic debate. This is not some artless recreation of peasant life. This is intellectually informed, exciting and new. This is the counterpart of the arts and crafts movement mm. in England. You will find here what we call the National Romantis, mm. Romanticism, the National Romantic Movement. Uh, when not only artists, you have authors, you have poets, uh, mm. uh, composers, everyone, you know, taking an interest in that uh, genuine Swedishness mm. uh, and the countryside. So it seems to be everything from the way she arranged her flowers mm. to the simple clothes she dressed her children in, yeah. to the, you know, to the beauty of the entire environment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, it, it, it has become really an iconic has got an iconic status among Swedes and in, in the national identity. I mean, look at you know, you know, a, a magazine for, for interior design in Sweden, for instance, so you will find milieus that look like they, you know, Colin could have made them. You have that same mixture, you have the light, you have the flowers in the windows, you have you know, all yeah. that. Interior decoration sounds kind of frilly, mm. but in fact, she's helped define national identity. Definitely so, yeah. Looking at this rustic family home with fresh eyes, you can appreciate the modernity of Karen's vision. A heady combination of bold experimentation and artistic freedom. There is nothing of grandma about her weaving with its weird and wild motifs. I think here we have something really rather disturbing. It's like a cartoon image out of manga. There's a stylized animal here gripping on with nasty teeth. What on earth is this creature? But also there's something charming and hidden here. Here in the corner is a lovely little pear. And family tradition has it that her little daughter Britta came in eating a pear while her mother was at the loom and said, please put my pear in your weaving. Karen Larson is absolutely turning her back on the bourgeois conventions of Victorian art and at the same time putting children at the centre of her production. Larson's vision of a home was informal, imaginative and playful. But it amazes me to reflect that without Carl Larson's paintings, we might never have realised her originality. The fresh, unpretentious, easygoing, family-centred interior design of Carl Larson. Lifestyle as art for every woman, even today. She had created the perfect model of the modern home. 
but it would take more than half a century for the rest of us to catch up. Finally, in the 1950s and 60s, her vision for our domestic interiors would take hold, and one Swedish firm has seen it circle the globe. The way she did her home taught us to break conventions, dare to break conventions and f furnish your home according to your own needs. The philosophy is such a, a daring to use color much more. It doesn't have to be perfect. If there's one word, I think it's freedom. Freedom of body and freedom of mind and, and, and family is, is um, was quite revolutionary. Mm. It's ironic that a woman who gave up a professional career as a painter and pursued no personal recognition has nevertheless left an artistic legacy more palpable, tangible and relevant to modern commerce and the way we live now than any painting hanging in any museum in the world. The female artists I've chosen were all trailblazers, finding new ways for their art to shape our lives. In the early years of the 20th century, women were fighting for legal freedoms and political rights. Meanwhile, in Paris, a handful of designers were determined to emancipate women in a most practical way. How could women ever be free when they were physically bound, unable even to dress themselves? Here at a fashion retrospective at the Hotel de Ville, there is one designer that stands out from all the others. Known as the sculptor of fashion, she would offer women a whole new design aesthetic. Now perhaps the name of Vionnet is not so familiar to you as the others in this exhibition. Dior, Givenchy, Chanel, but in fact it's Vionnet who's the true revolutionary. You look at this dress and you think, looks pretty simple to me, but in fact it's deceptively simple. Vionnet threw away the corset, stiffenings, the bottoms, the petticoats. She cut the fabric in such a way that it sensuously clung to every curve of a woman's body. Vionnet had mastered the art of both celebrating and liberating femininity. The daughter of a tax collector, Madeleine Vionnet was born in 1876. She began as a seamstress at the age of 11, but by 18 she was struggling to reconcile the demands of a husband and young baby with her ambitions. The tragic death of her child at only nine months seemed to make the decision for her. Divorcing her husband, she threw herself into her career. Working her way up through the couture houses of Paris. But she grew frustrated. In her eyes, there was nothing more old-fashioned than fashion itself. She had a bold new vision. Her approach is really similar to uh, sculpture and architecture and go toward the idea that the most important thing in the fashion creation is the cut, the structure. Madeleine Vionnet is very famous about the invention of the bias cut. For example, if you take a piece of clothes like this, in the tradition before Vionnet, you were using the textile like this, you know, following the straight, this straight, straight line. And you put, you, you were cutting the dress with, a, uh, uh, with following this straight line. With Vionnet, you take the, the piece of material like this. On the diagonal. Yes. Absolutely. You cut across. Yes, and you drape it on, on the body like this. And you see the effect, you know, it floats around the body. 
is a fluid yes. as as water and uh, that is light as a cloud yes. you know it's very sensual it's the discovery of, yes. of sensuality Her clothes were artful in their simplicity. With a sculptor's appreciation of form, she worked with the female body, not against it. Viennet's approach wasn't just audacious, it was scandalous. She had not just ditched the need for a corset. Even undergarments were unnecessary. She gave a new generation of women freedom of movement and sensuality. As she later reflected, her success was like an explosion. By the 1920s, the House of Viennet was the grandest fashion atelier in Paris. All that remains now is the grand facade. But then, this hid the factory out the back, where there was a toiling hive of 1,200 workers, mainly women. A humble seamstress from Abbeville had scaled the very heights of the French fashion industry. Now a woman was not just the lead designer, she owned the business, and she used her power to improve the lives of her staff. An industry that had been notoriously exploitative of its seamstresses was to find in Vionnet a very different style of boss. Vionnet took extraordinarily special care of her predominantly female workforce. There was a free on-site doctor, dentist and podiatrist open to all her workers and their parents. There was an on-site creche and a fund so that every baby born to the workshop, be they legitimate or illegitimate, would receive a 500 franc note in the cradle. The world that Vionnet made was as woman-friendly as her clothes. But how can such a creative visionary and social pioneer not be seared on our cultural consciousness? While Coco Chanel's ubiquitous suit lives on through endless imitations, Vionnet absolutely resisted the notion of mass production. She refused to give up her creative control. Her entire production was photographed a clear record of every single design that came out of her house. Someone like Gabrielle Chanel, who always said to be copied is a great flattery. Madeleine Vionnet was against copy, and these copyright albums are very important in, in showing how ferociously she guarded her designs. She did consider that she invented something, and this invention not only should be paid for, but more importantly, respected. This even can be found in her label. Um, mm -hmm. Her label is her own signature, so it's a yes. very personal signature. But she will push that to the limit in including her thumbprint. That is extraordinary because uh, I, that hadn't occurred to me that she is signing it just like a painter signs yes. his, his work. Yes. I can see that it's structural to the fabric, but nevertheless it's not quite as simple as I'd expected from reading about her. It's not a question of simple, it's yeah. a question of pure. Because when a woman wore dress, this type mm. of dress, she could actually just slip it on. I Up see. until then, she needed a, a, a helper mm. to button up, mm. to put it in the right direction. This actually was the most modern of dresses because you could you dress yourself. Down. If you feel comfortable in your dress, you can say, thank you, Madeline. It's really her that took the shackles out of the female wardrobe and also made it quite luxurious and beautiful. In just 80 years, women had opened up entirely new territories of art and grasped social, political and economic freedoms. But as my journey comes to a close, I want to return to painting and celebrate a woman who demonstrates above all others how far we have come. America, the fastest growing economy of the early 20th century. Looking for an artistic identity, 
to match its global power and cultural dynamism. That challenge would be met by a woman who blazed her own trail and became the first great American artist. To say that Georgia O'Keeffe was single-minded is putting it mildly. Born in 1887 to dairy farmers in Wisconsin, by the age of 14, she had already proclaimed that she would be an artist. But by her early 20s, after stints at art school, she survived by taking teaching jobs across the Midwest. It was only when a friend showed several of her early sketches to Alfred Stieglitz at his New York Gallery 291 that her career was to take off. And he was electrified. He wrote to O'Keeffe, they're the purest, finest, sincerest things that have entered 291 in a long while. O'Keeffe responded, I make them just to express myself. Things I want and feel, but don't have words for. So at last, O'Keeffe felt that someone else understood, thereby forging a creative partnership between an impresario and an artist that would change the future of American art. Stieglitz became obsessed by the young artist. Despite being 23 years her senior, he realized he had met his intellectual and physical match. His passionate desire to possess her is documented in the hundreds of photographs he took of every little bit of her. He sought to capture her strong handsomeness, her steely self-possession, smouldering sensuality, but also the beauty of her languorous body. She had no prudish fear of nudity, which is pretty staggering for a young woman in 1918. O'Keeffe's sensual self-confidence would be reflected even more arrestingly in her work especially in one subject to which she would return time after time, the flower. But she would give it new meaning and power. Look at that whirlpool of purity sucking you in. But what's new about it? For centuries, women had painted flowers. Botanical art was seen as decorative, feminine, miniature, and unthreatening. But there's nothing tame about this bloom. Inspired by the telephoto lens, Georgia O'Keeffe has magnified her flower into a monument. She wrote, I decided that if I could magnify a flower onto a huge scale, you could not ignore its beauty. Gorgeous is too weak a word, I think, to describe its dreamy seductiveness. Ever the provocative publicist, Stieglitz mounted a series of exhibitions of O'Keeffe's flowers in the 1920s, associating them with his own frank photographs of her. The combination was combustible. Giddy on Freud, one critic said, here is a long, loud blast of sex. In this context, her flower abstractions were seen as unambiguous celebrations of female genitalia. Another critic, Paul Rosenfeld, trumpeted in 1921, her art is gloriously female. Her painful and ecstatic climaxes give us to understand something man has always wanted to know. The organs that differentiate the sex speak. O'Keeffe was furious to have her art reduced to gynaecology. O'Keeffe insisted that the critics were talking rubbish, projecting their own views, not her intentions. 
While such controversy did not stop her being a commercial success, O'Keefe felt her art was compromised. By late 1929, O'Keefe found her professional life increasingly unfulfilling and faced crisis in her personal life. Stieglitz had taken up with a younger woman. She felt close to breakdown. In an all-American move, she headed west to escape to the barren desert landscape of New Mexico. She seems to call one in a way that one has to answer it, she wrote. This is my world and it fits me exactly. O'Keefe spent five months here that first summer, but she would return almost every year for the rest of her life. She just drank in the landscape, the people, the culture, feathers, birds, uh, all of these things that were new to her. She created 23 paintings uh, during that five month period. And it's astonishing to me that she had the power to rise to that. Mm -hmm. And instead of it being crushing, it became the second great opening in her career. Do you think She's an icon for women today because of that sort of steely self-reliance. I think so. One of the things um, that I didn't imagine uh, coming to work here as the curator is how people respond to her. I thought it would be about the artwork. I actually think the iconicity of O'Keefe is that she lived the life she wanted to live. And I think there are very few men or women who can say that. In any era. Yes, at any time, right now, for instance. Mm -hmm. It was here that O'Keefe fostered the image that would become so iconic, alone strong, independent, seemingly as harsh as the rocky desert around her. For her, this was such a beautiful, lonely feeling place, such a fine part of what I call the far away. It spoke to her deeply about what she thought was her mission in life. I must show the wideness and wonder of the world as I live in it. The move to New Mexico was a tectonic shift for O'Keeffe's art and therefore for the history of American modernism. American abstraction would now draw on the grandeur of America itself, not on European civilization. And nowhere is that clearer than in her colors. Look at these singing tones. Her desert palette. The light is different here. O'Keeffe's work in the desert was prolific and hugely significant. The woman who was famed for her flower abstractions now found inspiration in the landscape, architecture and Native American culture of the West. Georgia is not looking to other examples. She's kind of a radical individual. She's painting these at a moment when almost every artist in America is anxious about how to make American art, in part because so many of them have trained in Europe mm -hmm. and they feel, they know they're doing things that are derivative. Yeah. She isn't. She's creating something that is unique and original in hers and that becomes part of the modernist vision. She opens America's eyes to a new way of painting and a new way of understanding what art can do to help us think beyond what is merely in front of our face. Georgia O'Keeffe wasn't a female artist, she was an artist, full stop. 
and the greatest American artist of her era. We've come from the Renaissance, where women barely left the home, to a lone woman refusing to follow in anyone's footsteps and taking inspiration from the widest skies on earth. When asked what it took to become a female artist, O'Keefe answered bluntly, nerve. And it's nerve that fueled so many of the women I've encountered down the centuries. The nerve of Artemisia Gentileschi to cast off the victimhood of sexual abuse, to forge an international career. The nerve of Maria Sibylla Merian to leave husband and home, voyaging to the remotest rainforest to capture the tropics in monstrous technicolor. The nerve of Rose Bertin to claw her way up from a humble shopkeeper to define the glamour of the Ancien Regime. And it was Georgia O'Keeffe's nerve that brought her here to paint a new language for America. It is courage that inspires me most across the centuries. And the women who remade the world in their image had that in dazzling abundance.